I am your host, Rock Pilon, and today I have a very special guest with me, Nick Lavery, uh, Green Beret, and a Jim Reapers athlete. I'm super stoked to have him in town. We've been hanging out all weekend. And just in case you don't know who this guy is, um, let me go ahead and give a very brief introduction. He's earned a silver star, a bronze star with valor, three bronze stars, three purple hearts, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Joint Commendation Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, and the Special Operations Commands Excalibur Award. Connor Narciso from Wired uh, quotes, if Army scientists and tattoo artists had hijacked a DARPA lab to create the ultimate soldier, they would have created Nick. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, it's good to be here, man. Thanks. Just stoked to have you. Yeah, man, likewise. So what do you think of uh, Boise? Let's just jump into that real quick. Boise's great, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, I was telling you earlier, it's kind of a, like a forgotten state. And I don't mean that in any kind of disrespect. Um, it's just not one you think about. And when you do, you think of potatoes, and that's kind of where it ends. Right. But having talked to some friends and family that have been out here before, they all just rave about it. Um, it's kind of a, a hidden gem almost. And having been here now for the last couple of days and being able to see it for myself, th- they're right. You know, because you get a lot of different aspects. You know, even just the topography. Oh, yeah. You know, you think just these like flat potato farms, but you got mountains, you got trees, you got great weather, good people, good food. It's a really great vibe, man. So I'm looking forward to spending more time here in the future. No, yeah, if, uh, we've, we've been stoked to have you in town. And, you know, just, just being able to, you know, spend more time with you, learn the lessons of uh, what you've been through and um, just just pull from that. You know, I got the opportunity to watch you train multiple times. And, you know, that was a, a different level of training. And we'll, we'll get into, you know, a little bit about w- like the awards and, and where, where that came from and your journey into that. But I want to get into your mentality because a lot of people off, off first glance, you're six five. First of all, uh, six five uh, above the knee amputee, and tatted up. When you walked into the gym, I don't know if you noticed. Uh, everybody kind of stops, looks a little bit, and we've talked briefly. Uh, what's it? What's it feel like to like you know you're you're walking in the gym, that presence. Have has that? Have you always been like that, or like tell me a bit about that? Yeah, man. I mean, that's. I think that comes with just being larger than average sized human being. You know, it catches people's attention. It's certainly been amplified now when you come in with, you know, kind of a cyborg leg. Uh, so now there's there's a lot for someone to try to process, right? Like big, bald dude, tatted up. And then once I start talking, obviously it's got kind of a unique accent for this area. Then that's just another layer that someone's trying to figure out, like, what, what, is, what am I looking at right now? What, what's happening? Um, but it's cool, you know? I mean, I do notice it whether I'm walking to the gym or the grocery store in a hotel um, and you know, I'm 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 fine with it. It's really no issue. I was telling you about this just last night. What I, what I find really interesting is is when I'm around kids, right, like seven, eight years old, with no filter. Yeah. And uh, they're just real quick to say, "Hey, mom. Hey, dad. Like, like, look at this guy. Look at his robot leg." And I hear that a lot. And uh, I always just see that as a, as a pretty cool opportunity. You know, if if the moment presents itself where I'm able to be open and have that quick dialogue with that individual or that family. You know, I take that very seriously. It's, 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 a, it's a cool opportunity and not one to, to just bypass. You know, it's not something I fall force on people, you know, just kind yeah. of read the situation. But, you know, I'm pretty – I'm actually pretty approachable once you get past the, the facade of my exterior. Uh, so I, you know, I look forward to those opportunities. No, absolutely. Well, and, and, and just, to, just to kind of take it back a bit – uh, with the accent, where, where were you born? Um, you know, what were you like as a kid? What what uh, what, what interest did you have? Yeah, so from Boston, um, originally, I really moved around a lot as a kid throughout Massachusetts, in the city, North Shore, down South. I moved about every 12 to 18 months mm-hmm. as a kid growing up, um, which is actually a huge part of who I've turned into be, you know, because that's, that's, that's a challenge as a kid, being the new kid in school every year and struggling to make friends and kind of find your way and get some kind of foundation. I really didn't have that uh, throughout my entire upbringing. Uh, Athletics 
was something that was always available to me, no matter where I went, what school I went to. There were, you know, youth athletic programs that I could get involved in and my parents would put me into. So that became kind of my anchor, something that gave me some purpose. Um, and that was what I kind of fell in love with. That was what, like, drove me to, to want to be athletic and train. And that's really my introduction into – you know, social engagements and whatnot. So started out as an athlete, played every sport there really is. Um, played football and several other sports through high school. I really excelled in football. And that was really the reason why I went to college. I went to UMass Lowell, D2 ball uh, to play. Did that. And, um, and yeah, and then right around that time was when I really started looking at the military, you know, as an option. After graduation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and what, so did you have a career path chosen or what did you go to school for? I studied criminology. Criminology. Yeah. And then after after graduation, are you just like instantly thinking, OK, I'm going I'm going the military route or were you looking at other uh, potential careers? Yeah. I mean, I had started looking at the military uh, more seriously, actually, in high school. I met with a Marine Corps recruiter. I think it was my sophomore year. And he's like, yeah, cool, man. I graduate high school and come back and talk to me. So, I mean, I wasn't totally committed at that point, but I've been looking in that direction. And ended up going to, going to, going to school um, mostly to, to play ball. And then my sophomore year at college was 9-11, which is obviously a huge impact on me and those of us that were old enough to really appreciate what was going on. And I really struggled with just staying in school at that point. And I really contemplated just getting out and enlisting right there and then. And with the guidance of some mentors and some family, I stayed in and I grinded out my degree. So pretty much right after I graduated was when I started looking at options to enlist. And, and with those mentors, you know, how powerful was that to, to finish? Like, is that something you'd recommend to people that are looking at, at going into the military in, in, in that, that potential situation? Yeah, I think it's an individual decision. I don't think there's really a wrong answer. There's certainly upsides to, to gaining your degree. Uh, for sure, and it does open up opportunities for you once you decide you want to enter the military. You have more options available as in terms of what you may want to do. Um, coming in prior to college or mid-college, the military has a variety of options where you can leverage to obtain your degree while you're in, in the military. So I don't think it's really there's really a, a right or wrong answer. I mean, certainly if you have ambitions to come in as an officer, that requires a four-year degree. So um, that's certainly something to take into consideration as well. So, I mean, I would just look at, you know, the desired end state. What, 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 where do I see myself in five years, ten years? Um, and what do I want to be doing in the military? I think you use those variables to help frame that decision. And once you got in there, did you already have that path chosen? All right, I want to be in this special forces. Like, did you already have that vision, or were you thinking, "All right, let's see how this goes"? Like, how I guess level of commitment. What do you? What's going through your mind? You're 24 years old. Yeah, so I knew I wanted to go into special operations. Uh, I felt like my physical attributes could be best utilized there, and I also wanted to be able to make as much of an impact as a single person could make. And I felt like the special operations community w was where I could do that. So when I started meeting with recruiters, I went into a recruiting station that had the Navy, the Marines, and the Army in three separate offices in the same building. And I met with the Navy first. The Navy SEALs was the first thing in my mind, which is, is pretty typical when you think about special operations. The Navy SEALs come to mind really fast. That was the same for me. So I walked in, asked the recruiter, hey, I want to become a SEAL. How do I do that? He's like, cool, you got to enlist in the Navy, and then you can request to go become a SEAL. So I would have had to have spent time in the conventional Navy. And I said, great, thank you for the information. I left. I walked down the hall. I had the exact same conversation with the Marine Corps recruiter. At the time, neither of them had any opportunities to just go straight into those services. The Army, however, did, which was the last conversation I had in that same day. And they had then, which they still have now, it was referred to as the 18 X-ray contract, which is that of a special forces recruit. So it gives guys and now gals the opportunity to just go straight into special forces, bypassing any conventional military time. 
it's a little bit of a risk because if at some point if you don't make it through, if you get dropped from training, then you become what we call needs of the army, which means that they can essentially put you anywhere that they want. Mm. So it's a little bit of a gamble, but I was real confident about it. I still didn't make my decision based purely off of that piece of information. So I went home and I did some research into what Army Special Forces really did, how they do it. And although the speed to get there was certainly a factor after doing some homework, that was really what I felt to be the best fit for me. I was drawn to unconventional warfare, which is what Special Forces teams really focus on. It's our primary task, but there's also layers and several other mission sets that SF teams are expected to be proficient in. So the wide range of employment was something that I was drawn to. And then just the small team dynamic. So, I mean, it, it was a pretty clear-cut decision for me at that point. It took maybe a couple of days to think it over, talk to my family, and then yeah, and then I enlisted. And when you were, when you were enlisting, it, were you physically already prepared? Like, to, like, what kind of preparation did you do to get there? Yeah, so I had been done playing ball at that point for about a year and a half. And I transitioned, and it was really getting into strongman and powerlifting type stuff, okay. um, which was just a new means to compete and a new way to test my body. It also helped me with what I was doing for work. I was doing nightclub security and personal security in Boston. Uh, so it was cool. So I really just got really big and strong, and I was I was over 300 pounds oh, at wow. one point. Right around that time when I started looking at the military as an option, I was ending my, my college career, about to graduate. So I did begin training right around the time that I started meeting with recruiters, and I ended up laying down about a 16-week program specifically to get me prepared for basic training, and I just sliced off, you know, all the weight, you know. So by the time I left for Fort Benning for basic, I was down to about 240, you know, 245 um, shredded. shredded up, yeah. yeah, you know, shredded up because I was so big, you know, when I started to cut. So yeah, I trained up specifically for it. It was it was new because I had been doing just a lot of heavy lifting stuff, so it was it was quite painful. Um, but I showed up to basic in in really top physical condition. And and going through that, where, like, how was that experience? And then going to your team, like, can you can you run me through that process and that time frame? I don't have context for it. Yeah, so start to finish took me about two years to get through. Yeah. Um, nowadays, they've revamped the Special Forces qualification course, which is the pipeline you go through um, once you get selected. And they've really streamlined that. When I went through, there was a lot of downtime or what we call white space that existed in between these different phases of training. So you would go to phase one and that would last seven or nine weeks or whatever. And then you'd have like a month or two off in between before you would start training again. And in that window, you would just be doing like PT formations, maybe taking some classes, but you weren't really progressing through the pipeline. They've now cut all that white space out so it's much faster. For me, it took two years, which includes basic training, which is where I started. Um, going in as an infantryman, you, you gain an infantryman background when you go in as an SF recruit. So Fort Benning... For basic training in AIT, which is combined, um, referred to as one station unit training or OSIT. So that was 16 or 17 weeks. From there, I went to airborne school, which is also at Fort Benning. That's like three or four weeks. And then that's when I transitioned over to Fort Bragg, which is where all the SF training actually happens. Um, there is a, a preparatory course for selection that 18 x-rays go through. And the name has changed, I'm sure, several times. It's like a five or six week course you go through, and it just gets you more physically prepared for what selection has to offer. Uh, mine was cut short. I was only in that course for a week uh, because the next selection class was actually short on bodies. They had more space, so they yanked like the top 10% performers from my class and just threw us into selection early. So that shaved off probably a month of time or so for me. Then it was in the selection. At the time I went through, that was 14 days. Um, and then once you get selected from there, then you go into the actual Q course, so the SF qualification course, which for me took just a little over a year. And that's where you start to learn more advanced tactics, small unit tactics, 
language training, survival training, evasion training. Um, there's there's quite a bit of stuff you do in that during that duration. Then you also learn your your actual specific job. So at that point, I was selected as an 18 Bravo, which is the MOS or the identifier associated with a special forces weapons sergeant. Because every guy on an SF team or what's referred to as an ODA has a specific job, a specific skill set, specialty, if you will, that they hone in on. So I was a weapons and tactics guy. So during that Q course, you also learn weapons, malfunctions, maintenance, tactics, how to run ranges, like that kind of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, after that, I was uh, I was officially in my group. So. And once you're in your group, you're you, how how long before that point were you uh, deployed? I originally went to third group, um, and by the time I got there, I believe I was there maybe five months or so, uh, maybe five or six months. Got to my team. And I was thrown back into language school. I learned Russian in the Q course. And then when I got to third group, which at that point really was only operating in Afghanistan, they decided to send me back to language school to learn Dari, which mm -hmm. is one of the predominantly language spoken in Afghanistan. So I spent four or five months learning Dari. And then maybe a month or two after that, doing some collective training with the guys. And then I was in Afghanistan for my first deployment. Learning Dari, so just uh, how, how does that work, and, and at what level uh, are you are you are you learning this language? Yeah, you know I'd say I mean? at the end of that training, I have what we would call a a, a working knowledge of the language. Um, you know, enough to be able to maintain basic conversations, and we t typically would hone in on um, verbiage and language associated with tactics to be able to advise on the battlefield. So yeah. certainly not fluent. I, uh, I, I'm not a great language learner. I feel like it's somehow connected to whatever lobe of your brain is associated with artwork and music and kind of that creative mind, which is not me. I'm much more science and like analytically based. Yeah. My wife, for example, she speaks, I think, six or so languages. She's wow. an artist. She's a musician. So maybe that's why I correlate those two things together because she's able to pick it up really fast. For me, it's just a grind. It's just repetition after repetition. It's like training jujitsu, where it's just, just you got to do it a million times to get it locked in. But what I did learn is... Once I learned one foreign language, it became easier to learn the second one and then the third one. And you just kind of tap into that section of your brain where you're able to associate you know, these new sounds and vowels and sentence structures and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it was tough. I mean, it, it was difficult. But it, it proved to be a lot of value. Cause when, when you're over there. When you're over there. Yeah, because yeah, if you're on a team of 10 guys, 11 guys, and you're all moving in different directions at different times, you know, you may only have one or two interpreters that are attached to you. So the, the need to communicate when you're working alongside anybody is critical. Like hand signals only really go so far. So my proficiency was at a high enough level where I was able to function without the use of an interpreter, which yeah. is great because it opens it up for the other guys who, you know, would need them. Wow. And how many languages do you speak today? Uh -huh. I have, a, again, a working knowledge now of two. Two. Dari and then Persian Farsi. Okay. My Russian, I haven't touched at all since I graduated the course, yeah. which was now like 12 years ago or something. So I stay up on my on my Dari um, just because Dari and, and Farsi are, are very closely related. Dari is almost kind of like a lazy version of Farsi. Yeah. But they come from the same alphabet. And a lot of the words are actually very similar. So those, those are the two that I, I stay proficient in. And so when you're on your first deployment, I mean, uh, ex tell me how that goes. Tell me, tell me like lessons you've learned, um, things, you, things you encountered. Yeah, so my first deployment, I was on a unique sort of team where we did a lot of different types of, of activities and operations. Uh, whereas, you know, teams that I was on later in my career – were strictly direct action focused teams. Like that's all we really did and that's all we trained for and that's how we were employed. My first team, um, we were responsible with a lot of these other different types of tasks and mission sets, which was great because I was exposed to a lot of what SF teams are capable of doing. 
it made it also increasingly challenging because I'm now tr- I'm having to learn a lot of different things, right? So from right. getting into up armored trucks, you know, in full camo with the machine guns and all the stuff, and going out on more kinetic things, to you know your more lower visibility type operations as well. So a really good exposure to a lot of different things that we do. And that was a nine month deployment, so we were there for quite some time. We were running split team operations as well, which is kind of its own dynamic. Um, in terms of leadership and communications and responsibilities, you take a team and you split it in half. Everyone's workload now just becomes more amplified. So I learned a ton. Um, the guys I was with, it was a real senior team, a lot of older dudes that have been around for quite a bit. So um, they taught me you know, what I needed to know, and I made a whole lot of mistakes and learned from those. But what was really critical, man, is we talked about kind of my lead up into the military. My initial plan was to come in go to SF, do my five-year contract, and then get out and then go work in the government sector. The Secret Service was what I was kind of honed in on. I mm. wanted to be on like the protective detail for the president. That was like the ideal job for me. So I was gonna come in, serve, serve my time, you know, contribute to the 9-11 fight, and then also draw those skill sets and those capabilities and that knowledge, and then rechannel that towards what I thought my passion was. Right. It was at, the, at that time. On that first trip, um, everything kind of changed. It was really where I fell in love with with this profession and felt like I, I, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. So I actually re-enlisted again while I was in Afghanistan on that first deployment towards the end of it. Um, I committed to another six years, I think it was, and um, kind of just went all in to that job and that lifestyle from that point. What, 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 was there a specific moment that sparked that passion, that sparked that um, like idea, or was it just a culmination of everything coming together? Yeah, I can't, I can't picture a specific moment in time. Um, I can remember having a conversation with my father, you know, about halfway through the deployment, and of course he's checking up on me, how's it going? You know, yeah. I'm telling him what I can in terms of what we're doing, and uh, I remember talking to him and saying, "Man, I really, I really love this stuff, and I think I'm going to reenlist and make this like a longer, a longer play." And he's like, yeah, man, that you know, sounds cool. Like, like, go for it. I think, I think you found a nice niche. Like, he had never heard of me talking about something with mm-hmm. that level of passion and excitement. Yeah. So I think he could tell, my family could tell, you know, my teammates, my leadership could tell that I was really kind of coming into my mold. Yeah. And uh, I was just going to be ramping it up, you know, as soon as we got back stateside, which is, is exactly what happened. When you were telling me that your, your dad initially wasn't, wasn't uh, as supportive. <laughs> so there was that transition. <clears throat> yeah, um, that's that's probably accurate. I really don't want to say he wasn't supportive, but yeah, um, he certainly was not a fan. Yeah, yeah, of me enlisting. And you know, I'm I'm 24 years old. I just graduated college. I've been through some things in life. Right. Right. I'm not like a 17 year old kid who needs my father to sign a permission slip to let me enlist. Right. And I had made my decision. It was just a matter of what branch and what direction I would go in. But I was committed. And I, I called him up and just let him know, hey, Dad, like, I'm, I'm going to go into into the military. I'm looking at the 18 X-ray contract. This is what we do. This is what Green Berets do, whatever. And uh, he flat out told me no, which is comical, you know. Yeah, even in the man. moment, it's yeah. funny. It's even more funny looking back. Like, yeah. you just told me no. Like, he's going to ground me. Like, he sent me to my room and not let me enlist. Um, but I don't blame him, you know. He's my father. He's scared. He sees what's going on overseas. He right. sees combat. He sees guys getting banged up. Like, I'm now the father of two boys, and chances are even someone who does what I do would probably struggle with that. Right. You know, it's just only natural. So I totally understood it then. I understand it now. Um, you know, you fast forward even just a couple of years, and certainly fast forward 14 years to today, and he's just like my biggest fan. I mean, he's all in on what we do. He it's reads awesome. all the books. He wears all the swag. Yeah. You know, he's very proud, um, which is which is which is pretty cool, man. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And, and on what deployment um, was the initial, uh, you, there was a situation where you got shot in the face, but you thought you'd hit a tree branch. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was that my second deployment. Second deployment. Yeah, second deployment. And in between my first and my second, I switched teams and I went to a direct action focused ODA. So we went back in Afghanistan uh, the following year after my first trip. And... Um, we knew the kind of fight we were getting into and it turned out to be just that so highly kinetic and i i was banged up once before i took some shrapnel to the back of my shoulder it really wasn't that big of a deal um 
and then I was back with the team within a couple of weeks. And then about a month or two later, somewhere like that, um, yeah, one of our vehicles got hammered with an IED, and I was maneuvering on foot towards the vehicle, towards the crash site, and you know, a couple threats showed up, so eliminated those. And then there was a third one that was kind of running away almost on this angle and just spraying his AK-47 over the back of his shoulder in my general direction. Uh, and one of them clipped me in the side of the face, but I, I didn't know that's what it was. You know, I was in this really densely populated apple orchard, and I thought I'd run into a, a branch is what I thought had happened. I didn't find out hours, hours later when I eventually ended up at the hospital that um, it was from a it was from a bullet from an AK, you know, forty seven. Wow. Well, and um, on what deployment did the 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 accident happen with your leg? How, how much, same deployment. Same, same deployment. Yeah. So I was wounded three times on that trip on three separate occasions. The last one being um, what ultimately resulted in the loss of my leg. And and uh, for people that that don't know. Um, can you can you dive into that situation a little bit and then also the transition mentally um, as you started going through recovery we've talked yeah. a bit about that this weekend yeah i mean the short version of the story with the injury is we were preparing to go on an operation with a, a lot of different afghan security force elements which is nothing new to us and um right before we broke our f- comms uh check and our pre-mission brief uh Afghan National Police officer jumped up on the back of a truck with a mounted machine gun and just opened up fire into the group. It was almost an ideal scenario for them. And this was a pre-planned um, ambush, so that was the that was the trigger for the ambush. And then we started taking rounds and rockets and stuff from outside the compound. So um, I ended up getting hit. Uh, it was estimated to be four times in my right leg, and I took a round in my lower left leg as well. Uh, my scrotum was lacerated so I was pretty banged up and um, you know between myself performing medical interventions on myself as I had been trained to do and obviously my teammates there uh, doing the same I uh, I obviously managed to survive that Um, things got a little bit more complicated you know when I got medevaced eventually which took about 90 minutes or so before the bird was able to land and they brought me to uh, location that had a forward surgical team. I needed a blood transfusion really bad. My femoral artery had been severed, and uh, they administered one with the wrong blood type. You know, they mixed up myself and another guy on my team who was also on that same flight, and that that almost killed me. In a lot of ways, it did. You know, I ended up coding several times after that, and uh, they didn't really realize what had happened originally, or at least initially. They just knew my entire body was crashing, but I was dealing with so many injuries that it would have been really easy to just assume that it was because of just the massive loss of blood and how much trauma my body was dealing with. So they threw me on another helicopter and they sent me to Bagram, which has a higher level of medical care. And it was on the flight that was there where the docs realized that they had mixed up the blood. So they called Bagram Hospital and just said, hey, we just administered a blood transfusion with the wrong blood type, incompatible blood type. Uh, There's no way this dude's going to survive the flight, so just be ready to receive his body when he gets there. And in a couple of ways, they were kind of right. You know, I coded it on that flight as well. Um, but they got me off. They, they threw me right into surgery. Um, started pumping me full of right blood, put me on dialysis, started amputating my leg. And, um, you know, obviously I managed to survive because I'm here talking to you today. The, uh, at least the mindset at the time of the injury, because, I mean, the, my mentality during this journey has, has changed, you know, several times, different areas of focus things I've learned about myself and how I've had to adapt my mentality and my mindset over time. But when I was in that moment there on the ground, uh, I was surprisingly content with what was happening. I mean, I was convinced I was dying. I mean, I knew my femoral was cut. I saw the river of blood. Mm -hmm. I've been medically trained by my medics to know that I have maybe eight to 12 minutes before I'm out of blood. So I'm, I know I'm done. I'm convinced I'm done. And actually, I was trying to get a lot of my teammates that were working on me away from me. Like, I am a lost cause. Like, go help guys that you can help. I didn't know the severity of how many casualties there were, but there were dozens of us laying on the ground, shot up, different yeah. degrees of injury. So they, of course, ignored me. You know, they did what they're trained to do, but I knew I was dying. But I was surprisingly okay with it 
um, because if I was going to go down, I wanted it to be fighting, right? Like, I was born to be a warrior. Like, that's my purpose. That's the way warriors go down. Like, I was cool with it. It was really frustrating, though, given what we had been through, what I had been through up to that point, to it be at the hands of someone that I was working alongside of. Like, right. that was really frustrating, right? That betrayal aspect um, really stings. So I can remember being really frustrating or frustrated about that. Um, you know, feeling some guilt towards my family and what they were about to have to deal with and endure was tough. Um, but I was, I was in the fight really the entire time. I was either working on myself or I was t- trying to talk to the guys that were laying on the ground around me. So I really wasn't this like majestic moment where I'm like laying on this field and I'm watching my like life flash before my eyes and like everything fades to black. I was busy, you know, I was, I had things I needed to be doing. So there's the, those emotions and those mentalities that I was having at those times were just very short snippets, you know, like real quick, boom, like frustrated, angry a little bit. I feel bad for my family. Like this is going to suck. Um, but I'm a warrior and I want to go down on my shield, but that all happens like rapid fire, boom, 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 like done, like get back to work, like, get, stay in the game. Um, and then of course, like over time, like I was saying, the, the mindset obviously shifts, you know, once I get into recovery and start getting back to action and start doing more stuff. And, and, and that recovery period. So you, you get, um, you said there was five weeks where you were in Europe, uh, when we were talking before, um, at that, at that. Uh, their hospital, I forgot the name. So I was in Afghanistan for five days once I got to the hospital because okay. I was real touch and go, right? right like right. intensive care, critical condition. Um, I wouldn't have survived a flight to Europe. So I was there for five days. Trying to stabilize you. Trying to stabilize me. Okay. Um, I'm on a ventilator. I'm on dialysis. They're pumping me full of blood. Like I'm a complete disaster. Um, five days goes by. They get me stable enough where they think I'll survive the flight to launch duel, which is in Germany a right. major military hospital hub for us. So I was in Germany, but I was only there a day. I was in Germany a day. I don't really remember being there. I do know in retrospect that they hacked off my leg up to my knee. And then I was in Walter Reed and Bethesda the, okay. the next day. Got it. And as you're going through, how long was that period before um, you're like coherent and you're back up and you're like, okay, you're starting to understand your, your new situation that you're in? Yeah, it's kind of interesting, man, because I do remember, and I've actually, I was talking to one of my commanders when I was still still in Afghanistan, and like I'm on life support essentially, right? Like nothing in my body is able to really work for itself, right? And I can remember muttering out, or maybe I wrote it down, um, that I wanted to go back to my team, you know, like I'm I'm good to go, sir. Like send me back to the guys, and I'm obviously a mess at this point. I had been somewhat conditioned a little bit because I had been injured twice before. You know, I eventually I was medevaced for both of those times as well. So I was in the hospital and they put me back together and it was like, I'm back, I'm, I'm back with the boys within like a week or so. So I think I may have just been conditioned to just, I can get past this and get right back into the fight. Like no problem. So no complete whatsoever understanding of the severity of my situation. Right. Um, it really wasn't until I got to Walter Reed that uh, I realized how much of my leg was gone at that point. And I'm in the ICU at Walter Reed as well. I was there another couple weeks because I was still real touch and go. And uh, the my surgeon came in, who's still a great friend of mine to this day, and he's like, hey, man, this is I'm, I'm Dr. So-and-so, and uh, I'm going to be operating on you. Here's the situation. And I'm whacked out on ketamine and morphine and Dilaudid, but I can like kind of grasp what's going on. I can remember this conversation clear as day. He's like, your leg is riddled with infection. You've got bacteria and fungus and mold. Everything is just growing in your body right now. And a lot of those things can kill you. My staff wants to take your leg off at the hip uh, right now and then just like eliminate this problem and just get you moving on with life. He's like, but I think I can save more of your leg. It's just going to be a street fight. Like I have to just incrementally start hacking and hoping the antibiotics will take over. He's like, I need you in this fight with me. And uh, I'm like, yeah, doc, let's do it. He's like, okay, cool. Let's do it. And, you know, and then it was just surgery three, four times a week, you know, antibiotics, amputation, antibiotics, amputation, just over and over and over again, trying to get ahead of the infection. Um, which they eventually were able to do, you know, it ate my quadricep and my hamstring 
So I don't have a lot of muscle left in my residual limb, but I was able to keep what I have, which is, you know, very much a blessing because the, when you talk about amputations, man, and I didn't know this until then, is it's really not the loss of the limb. It's the loss of the joint that really makes the difference, mm. right? It's the loss of the ankle or the knee. Because we can nowadays replicate a tibia and a fema pretty easily. Right. When you start losing joints, then it starts to amplify things drastically. So I was already down too, right? The ankle gone, the knee's gone. If you essentially remove my hip, there, there are hip disarticulation patients and people living life now that do perform and function on prosthetics but it's a whole nother realm of difficulty uh, compared to even an above the knee guy or certainly a below the knee guy so his willingness to go through that slug fest with me uh, was critical because regardless of how hard I really worked there's essentially no way I could have continued to do what I wanted to do if I if they had taken my leg up to the hip wow that, that that simple decision keeps you in the fight today. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 was, were you consciously thinking, hey, let's let's that was a decision you made, like, hey, we're going to fight this the whole way. There was never a thought of like, yeah, just take it at the hip. Let's stop this infection. No, never. No. Again, I didn't really process the difference between you know below knee, above knee, hip. Like, mm-hmm. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. It was more so him saying. I think I can do this and I want you to fight with me. Like he could have really been talking about anything at that point. And I would have been like, yeah, let's fuck, you know, let's do it. You know, whatever it is, let's do it. Um, Obviously now looking back, it's like, wow, that's, things would have played out much differently if I'd gone that direction. And your, and your road to recovery. So, so how long before then that you, you start thinking like, what are you thinking as you're going through that road to recovery? Are you still thinking I want to get with my team? How do I make this work? Yeah. Um, I was I was convinced really early on that I was going back to doing what I did, what I do, um, almost to the, to the point, well, literally to the point where some of my doctors and the psychiatrists that are all part of the kind of the whole of body wellness plan that you go into when you go to Walter Reed were convinced I was delusional. Right. Or like I hadn't, I was in shock. I, I was in denial. Like I hadn't quite grasped the severity of where I was at because they're still operating on me. And they're in the process of amputating my leg more and more and more. Right. And I'm making it known that as soon as you guys get done with this and you give me whatever you're going to give me that I can strap on my body to walk, I'm going back to work. You know, um, I didn't have any clue as to if that was possible, right? If the army would even let me stay in, how I would do it, what my like, training plan would look like. Like none of that was in my in my decision making or even in my mind. It was um, it was a lot of it in that point was fueled off of um, stubbornness, you know, and competitiveness, and a little bit of ego as well. You know, just no one's going to dictate my future but me. Right, like I'm in the driver's seat. I am going back. You're not taking me out of the fight. It was about me. You know, we can talk about how that changed uh, over time, but that's really what it was, man. You yeah. know, it was about me doing what I said I was going to do and just get, get out of the way. You know, and we talk about blind faith as you start start down that journey because there is no no one's done what you did to get to where you are before. There was no other like light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, man. Um, you know, at that time, this is in 2013, and you know, we as in the United States and special operations have been going hot in the paint in Afghanistan or other places, you know, for over a decade at that point. So there were a lot of guys that were injured before me, uh, including amputees, above the knee amputees that were, that managed to stay in the military. They managed to stay on active duty. Some of them even managed to deploy again, right? Um, and those guys at least began to move in the direction that I was trying to move into. Um, at that point, there had not been any any known data of an SF guy with an above the knee amputee as above as an above the knee amputee going back to a team and going back into combat. Like that was really what was the unprecedented aspect of it. Um, but I'm grateful for the guys that you know certainly attempted it and you know, kind of softened the, the, the battlefield up a little bit for me right. to be able to kind of just cross that goal line. And um, 
Yeah, it's it, it was faith, you know, which you know has a certainly a spiritualistic or, or biblical kind of tone or feel to it. But you know, for me, it's just believing in something for which there is no proof. Right? I, I don't know if what I'm trying to do is is real, like if it's even possible. Is this even a thing? Um, but I was convinced that I could do it, and I was there was no plan B. You know, that was all, I was all in on doing that. So. I wasn't in a tunnel. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel because I wasn't in a tunnel. I was, you know, climbing up a mountain in the middle of the night with rocks and wind and, and you know, and I can't see where I'm going, but I just one foot in front of the other, no pun intended, be- believing that there is a summit to this. As long as you just keep moving forward, you you can get there, you know. So, yeah, I mean, blind faith is kind of a nice way to just to just package that up. And, and are you like that process of getting back your physical training and your diet and, and your mentality, are you going all out? Like, all right, here's my goal. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I know I can do these things in my control. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of this, these were lessons learned through pain and failure, right? right. Um, Cause there's certainly a line, you know, where you cross into the realm of, of recklessness. And I did that many, many, many times. You know, so it, it was kind of a combination of just start doing stuff. Like, what can I do? And then just do a lot of it. Like, triple down on the things that you can do. But let's not neglect the things that you can't do right now or the things that are extremely challenging, right? Like, there has to be an investiture of time in both of those things. So I'm tripling down on the things I can do, whether that's body or mind or both. And then I'm continuing to test my limits on the things that I can't do yet, right? Um. And then the development of any kind of real strategy is what kind of came later, you know, and that's something that I, I talk about a lot is, is gain, do the research, like gain, have a plan. I didn't have much of a plan. I was just blindly doing stuff. Eventually I realized that there was a glitch in my system, that there really wasn't a, a, an outlined process, which obviously will flex left or right. But once I started to apply some practicality and some science um, to my approach in terms of what I was trying to do and where I would need to inject my focus and my bandwidth, that's when things really started to click. Um, so yeah, it was iterative in terms of doing things and then looking at my game plan, looking at my at my blueprint and adjusting that over time. Um, but I was all in. It just I wasn't doing it very smart to begin with. So, so are there like tactics that you've pulled from that that you still apply today? Like, you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I draw a lot from uh, military training that I've received and the way we go about planning strategy and tactics and operations. And you can take those models and those tools and those methodologies and you can essentially apply them to anything because really all it is is problem solving. That's, that's what it boils down to. So having those outlines there and creating tangible, usable products that I'm able to reference and update um, became a, a key aspect of how I was able to make more substantial progress over time once it's organized for me and laid out. So I applied those principles and those tools you know, to this day throughout you know, all facets of my life, including family, work, like my physical training, right? My education, like th- these things are, are deliberately ironed out with specific objectives and decision points that are built in along a linear path over time so that everything is structured and that I'm not, I'm not wasting time. I'm maximizing efficiency and I'm also logging and tracking what I'm doing to be able to have that data to then look back retrospectively and say, okay, like wh- wh- where am I, why am I lagging here? Why am I stagnating at this point? Why am I regressing here? And just apply some, you know, some science to it. Yeah. I noticed as you were training, um, this past weekend, you, after every set, you're, you're rewriting in the, the rep scheme, the exercise, if it was a superset, you know, yeah. and, um, so you apply that not only with your training, but with other other facets of your life. And is it, is it that simple? Is it just documentation, or are you? Is there spreadsheets? Like, can, can you dive into how that's physically done, or how you track it? Yeah, yeah. So it, I I was a little late to the game utilizing technology for that for for years, 
because that's how I was was raised. Really, it was you know pen and paper. Right. So I got stacks of logs and journals, you know, in my office at home. That you know they're great tools to be able to go back and reference. It just, nowadays with technology, you're able to. You have, we walk around with a computer attached to our hip or in our pocket all day. So everything is in there, and it's synced across all my platforms. I can pull it up at home. So my my general kind of day to day battle rhythm is, um, you know, I just have different folders for you know one for training, you know, one for family, which is just more like journal style, um, and then my stuff for work is mostly housed at work. Yeah. Um, but it's the same. It's the same principle. So I'll just be updating throughout the day, what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, how's it going. It really doesn't take that much time. You know, you think about like journaling, um, and for some people that just seems like I'm not going to sacrifice you know an hour out of my day to sit down and like write about how I'm feeling. Well, for me, it takes about ten minutes, and those ten minutes are an investment because when I go back usually on the weekends and I cumulatively look at what I've done throughout the week and then I organize it a little bit more effectively um, on some kind of a product or a spreadsheet, then now I've got usable data, right? You just, you've just you been showing me you know, over here at, at headquarters all these different tools that you guys use. It's really the same kind of stuff, man, yeah. where you're just increasing efficiency because in order to know where you're trying to go, it's really helpful to know where you came from 100%. and how you got to where you are today in this moment. That's important data. Yeah. So to apply that to the other facets of your life is really just an investment in where you're trying to go. Absolutely. Yeah. And it often gets overlooked by, you know, more action and less reflection. Mm. And so at a certain point, that action can become ineffective, mm -hmm. which is kind of what you're running into as you're training. You're going so hard. And we were even talking about how you've shifted your training slightly. Yeah. It's, it's really like you're looking at workaholics and people that just do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, doing stuff and accomplishing stuff are, are two different things. You do need to work hard to accomplish things. But if there's no structure or system to it, then chances are you're running in, in different directions. You're not progressing down a road in some kind of linear fashion. High performers invest increasingly amount of time in their strategy and their mindset because there's value in that right so it may take like you just need to stop physically moving and doing stuff and do some and reflect on what's going on and then organize that in a way that's it makes sense to you uh, that's not wasted time that's actually how high performers are able to do what they do you know it's just not aimlessly doing stuff like I was doing in my earlier days in the hospital. Like I was just doing things. Once I applied some, some science and some structure is when things really started to take off. And was there any mentors for you that kind of helped you get there? Or was this just like over time you're like, okay, this isn't going to work. And then you start reflecting as a, as a byproduct of that. <sighs> yeah, I did. I mean, of course I had mentors and, and guides along the way. Um, what really triggered it for me was, Eventually, which was tough, r realizing that no matter how hard I trained physically, I would not be as dominant as I was with two legs, right? And I come from an athletic background. My physicality is what I really brought to the team. It's what I enjoyed doing. It's what they asked me to do. It was a win-win. I knew that I, no matter what, I would not be that physically capable. So I started looking at other areas in which I could increase my value to remain an asset these other aspects of what makes a Green Beret good at its job. And it's in the you know, softer side of our business, right? Intelligence, culture, language, um, intelligence. How can I just increase my cerebral capacity to increase my overall value? Uh, which was brutal because I really didn't like doing that stuff. Right. You know, I liked lifting weights and doing jiu-jitsu and MMA and shooting guns and blowing stuff up. Like That's why I came in to the military. So forcing myself down that road, similar kind of just on faith is I'm convinced that this will bring that value that I'm going to need. Once I'm back with the boys, once I'm back on the team, this will raise that capital. So as I'm going down these roads, I'm going to different schools and I started pursuing my master's in psychology and I'm going to these, 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 these different training events in different military schools. Um, one of which is a school that's really designed to um, teach campaign planning, like large-scale military strategy. 
I had to get a waiver to go because I was such a lower ranking dude. Mm. Um, it's schools like that are reserved for your more senior guys who are going to be working at that level of command and planning. But I managed to get myself into the course, and um, and that's where they that they teach these methodologies, they teach these philosophies and these tools and these ways to think to solve large scale problems. That you have to you have to look at this from the macro, but then you have to whittle it down into what's actually happening at the tactical level, like on the ground. What are actual guys doing running around the battlefield? So learning that stuff um, is what allowed me to really take that and then apply it to myself while I was going through, at this time, now more advanced recovery once I'm out of the hospital. Um, and then again, that just kind of took things up to another level. And you know, my log and my trackers we're there to show the data, like, wow, you really are progressing in all these different directions. You're moving in the right path. This is this is working. Yeah. You know? And 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 that log and, and that tracking, um, as you progress closer and closer to getting back on your team, because that did eventually happen, mm -hmm. which I'd love you to for you to touch on. Um, when you reflect back on that, was it you could see that progression and did that drive you? Like was that a, a staple? Yeah, it was actually quite scary. Um so when I left the hospital, I went back to Fort Bragg. I was offered a full medical retirement. I, I said no to that. Um, it was a bit of a street fight administratively for me to stay in. I was successful at that. Got back to my unit. Um, made my intentions known immediately. I'm going back to my team. They were supportive of that, at least on the exterior. And uh, But I needed a job. So I started working as an instructor, teaching hand-to-hand -hand combat and, and CQB, close quarters battle. So I did that for about eight months. And now I'm in the more aggressive training. And at this point is where I started going to some of these military schools, learning strategy, um, learning tactical and operational planning, applying those things to myself as an individual with the overall end state being getting back on operational status. So I'm applying these techniques to the different areas that I knew needed attention, right? Mm -hmm. Physical training, intellectual training, administrative, like how do I navigate that? Um, tactics right so they're just broken down on just a chart and within that you've got your objectives and you've got your decision points you've got your decisive points and these are this is all military language but it's actually quite simple right once you once it's laid out it's like oh yeah this actually makes a lot of sense but it gives you that focus to what you're honing in on 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 this particular day or in this in this particular hour this is what i'm working towards yeah um when i talk about it scaring the hell out of me I talked about how initially it was about me, right? It was about my my stubbornness and competitiveness and a little bit of ego in there. It was about me getting back to the team because that's what I wanted to do, right? It was proving everyone wrong, proving myself right, all those things. As I start making progress in my recovery and eventually my unit starts having me start taking some tests and assessments and whatnot, but I'm knocking these things out and... Uh, you know, you would think that that would be very, like, motivating. Like, yeah, man, you're doing it. And it was. But, there, I mean, one night, dude, I woke up, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, man, in a cold sweat, and it hit me that I was trying to go back to a team, a team with, you know, 10 or 11 other dudes, um, many of which have families and kids. And, you know, you work in that capacity and that lifestyle, you, like, you're putting your life in someone else's hands, and they're doing the same thing for you. So I'm going – Oh man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm on the, I'm on track, but is this really what's in the best interest of the team? Right. And that was really hot, you know? So I, I bombed into work the next day and, uh, I had a couple conversations with some of my teammates and, uh, some other leadership and I was very candid and honest about it. And I'm like, Oh man, I want this more than anything. Like I'm obsessed with this, but I just don't know if it's what's in the best interest of the guys. And, uh, you know, they were honest with me as well. They're like, listen, we don't know how this is going to play out. Like, this hasn't happened before, but we want you back, and we will figure it out. And if it comes time for us to just say, hey, this just isn't working, you know, because I can't be a liability. I can't be a liability. There's too much at stake for that to happen. Uh, I have to be an asset. Um, and they were willing to, to at least for me to get there if I could and then take a look at it once we got on the ground and actually started operating. So – Scared the hell out of me for a minute. Um, really started questioning my intent and my integrity and my professionalism. Is this too much about me? Is this pure ego driven? Like, where am I at, man? So I was really scattered for 
you know, 24, 48 hours. Yeah. And I had an assessment coming up in uh, two days after that. So I'm like frazzled. Um, but then I quickly realized once I got that feedback from them, that objective feedback from them, and I started looking at them as my focus, they were my motivation to keep going. It was no longer about me. It was about them. Things just ramped up to another level at that point. Yeah. And now I was operating at, a, at an insane capacity. I was no longer thinking about myself, what's in the bench issues of these guys. I'm thinking about my teammate's three-year-old son. Yeah. When I'm walking to the gym, like that kid is the face that I'm, I'm, I'm only I'm able to see. And the productivity that came from that was, uh, was pretty tremendous. It was, like a, it was a catalyst for growth. And I, I think this weekend, I got to see that. And a couple of our members of our team got to see that because we were in the gym and you're probably 20, 30 minutes into your workout. And I mentioned this to you after. Um, I realized, oh, Nick's not working out. He's training for something way more than than anything I've ever seen. Mm. And I think the entire you, – you changed the, the energy in the gym. I think everybody felt it. We've never done a silent shoot. It was silent. Nobody spoke. <laughs> and it was, it was an hour and a half, two hours. Wow. And the energy was different. And I asked you at the end, I was like, hey, man, like, you're training. You're not even working out. But And I'm, I was, I'm trying to get in your head. I'm like, what are you thinking about? But, but talk about the difference between training – for whatever you're training for. I'm sure other people have their own versus working out. Yeah. Um, it, it's a good question, man. And, uh, you know, we could talk a, a while about, and I'm pretty big on the, the power of language and the language that we use both outspoken and internal to ourselves and how that can very easily set ceilings for ourselves or make excuses for ourselves, you know. Uh, but there's a, a, a no shit power that comes with our language and just our verbiage. So separating training and, and working out. Um, for me, you know, walking into the gym and moving around and doing some stuff, like that's a workout. Okay, cool. And it can be it could be an intense workout. Right? It doesn't mean you're just in there like messing all around, messing around, doing stuff. You can get after it in a workout. Uh, for me, training is with a very, very specific purpose on the back end of that. It's very crystal clear. Um, like professional bodybuilders, when they when they go into the gym to train, like they're looking at that next show and they are honed in on that. That's it. That's all they can see. That's all they can feel. They are in their training for a specific end state. So that I think that focus is really what separates it. You know, so I know for me personally, when I'm when I'm walking into the gym or I'm, I'm on the way to the gym or wherever I'm training that day or that during that workout, it's I'm thinking about why why am I going in there right now? What, what am I working towards? What is, what is today's goal? Um, in more of the macro sense, right? I need to be stronger for this next deployment. I, I need to be faster. I need more endurance for this school that I'm going to, you know, whatever it is. Um, but then once I walk into the facility, then, my, then it becomes more about my focus on this specific task that I'm doing, right? My, actually, my mind is like locked into every single rep that I'm doing. So it's, I feel like it's kind of layered um, macro to micro. And, um, you know, if you're able to hone in on the why, regardless of what you're doing, you're going to be more successful at it, right? Which we can talk about leadership, how that bleeds over into that quite easily. You know, keeping those around you informed on the intent, on the vision, right? If I tell someone to dig a hole then they'll probably go dig a hole. If I tell them to dig a hole because we're expecting, you know, an ambush tonight at 06, they're going to dig a better hole, right? Faster, um, yeah. faster and more efficient. Right. So keeping those around you informed on the, the why behind it. And now when it's just we're talking about ourselves walking into a workout or a training session, why am I walking into this gym right now? What am I doing? Right? What is, what is the purpose behind this? Um, to get you locked in on that and then just laser focus on every individual task because the strategy has already been laid out, right? The strategy is planned. My, my, my approach is planned. Everything's planned. I already know that. I dialed that in weeks ago, months ago. Now I know for a fact that this, you know, six sets of 10 on the squat rack is in line with reaching that overall objective. So now I'm just laser focused on that. And then just repeat, you know, repeat, repeat. 
And so how do people that are working out, how can they get to that point, that end state of, tra- of, of train? And is that tying into the purpose, the why? And how do they find that? Finding it is step one. Right. You know, finding it is step one. And if you go through a sequential sequence of events, um, there's a lot in there, right? Work ethic, consistency, teamwork, community, right? There's a lot. But if if your mission isn't what it is supposed to be, then it doesn't really matter how hard you're working. It doesn't matter how much you're studying. If you're progressing in the wrong direction, then you're not going to reach your goal. So before anything, it's really about determining what it is or who, what it is we want to do or who it is we want to be. And that may take a bit of time. You know, it may take some meditation or just some reflection, like go sit in a dark room, just be with yourself and really dig down and find out why are you on this planet, right? It's a, this isn't a dress rehearsal, right? We got one shot at this thing. Every person walking on earth is a miracle, like statistically a miracle. The likelihood of you existing here right now is almost as impossible as it gets. So what are you doing here? Like, why are you here? And I know people struggle with that. Um, it was something that took me until, you know, my early 20s to really kind of grasp that. Um, some people have a difficult time with that. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. It's kind of floating around. So if, you know, day after day, week after week, you're meditating, you're journaling, you're just thinking and reflecting, like, what is it I'm trying to do? Who do I want to become? If nothing is coming, okay, we need to start moving here at some point, right? We can't just hang out here indefinitely. Another technique that statistically will likely set you up for greater success is honing in on our actual talents, right? Talent versus skill, right? Talent is, is genetic, right? Talent is, is the, the gifts that we were given, right? Things that we are good at easily, things that we can do well in that doesn't take a lot of effort um, are typically our talents, so if you hone in on those, it gives you an advantage um, as you then begin to work and actually craft your skill around those talents. So if just thinking broadly isn't really getting it done, that's usually what I recommend as, as step two of the process. Many you know, life coaches and mentors and guides will have an inverted recommendation. No, 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 you need to hone in on your talents. Like that is how you're gonna be successful you need to double down on what you're already naturally good at and build on it. And I don't think they're wrong. I just have a difficult time being limited by anything. You know, I may be right. really great at cooking, right? I'm like a natural chef, but uh, I want to be a firefighter. Like, who's to say you can't do that? Like, nobody. So I just, I don't like putting restrictions on people and certainly not on myself, which is why I put that as kind of option B. Um, is to hone in on those, on those talents and then just kind of go all in in that direction. And just keep trying, just at bats. It's just reps, trying to figure out what you like, what clicks, and just building a progression to that. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, at that point, then it's really just the execution comes into play. Um, but if, you're, if, you, if you find yourself naturally good at writing or drawing or music or talking to people, Right or, or whatever it is, yeah. Because um, it may just be a very almost benign skill set or capability that, that you really don't. You may overthink, right? Like I'm comfortable in social engagements, right? I do well in crowds, um, or not, or I cut hair really good. You know, it could be anything that you may just overlook, and then it's okay. How do I turn this into a lifestyle? How do I turn this into a profession? How do I maximize what I'm able to do to then live a life of happiness and then, you know, provide whoever it is I'm providing this, this thing to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, once that is decided upon, you know, now comes the work and the repetitions and the consistency and et cetera. And, and, and the principles that you've pulled, you've formulated, uh, recently into a book. Tell me about the book. Yeah, man. Um, book's done. It's currently at the Department of Defense going through reviews, um, which is a requirement and makes total sense. 
So completely unknown timeline. I uh, I originally wrote down this methodology in in retrospect, uh, looking back on you know h- how did I get to where I am now, and uh, it's really split down the middle between mindset and then strategy. That's what it is. Like those those two facets is really what I leveraged to be able to you know get back on the team, and stay on the team, and continue to do stuff. Uh, so the book is. I'd say about 70% that, right? It's, it's in the self-improvement, personal development space. It's comprised of philosophy and tools and a methodology that is applicable to anybody, regardless of the goal, um, to be able to move from point A to point B. The other 30% of the piece is really just personal vignettes, stories that I experienced during the times of each one of these values and principles and tenets coming to fruition or again retrospectively looking back and realizing that 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 was the moment or that was the thing I went through where I realized the importance of of this particular aspect that I'm recommending people take you know consideration into um so uh, you know it's something I'm excited about it's something I've really struggled with you know writing a book um if you asked me five years ago if you'd ever write a book, I'd, I'd look at you like you just had asked me the square root of something. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, right. That's not me, man. I'm a warrior. I'm here to train and do my job, and that's it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of the spotlight and whatnot, but um, I felt like I had, I've learned some things that come from a unique perspective. And as far as I'm concerned, if what you're doing is not benefiting somebody else, then you are wasting your time. So why not just get that documented to be able to live on for as long as it can live on? Certainly, you know, beyond my life, hopefully. Um, I just felt like I had an obligation to do it. So I'm excited for it to come out, really just to get it into the hands of people, uh, that are, particularly those that are struggling with some adversity. Yeah. Uh, just to be able to, to have that kind of impact. And, and, and until that book comes out, do you ha- what, what kind of words would you have for somebody that's facing some adversity? You know, at whatever level it might be, they, they, they're facing something that they're struggling with. They don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is probably most people, right? Absolutely. Right. Everyone's struggling with something. Everyone's got those challenges. Um, to, keep it, to keep it somewhat brief, you know, something I come back to a lot is, um, you know, never make a decision when you're at your highest high or your lowest low, right? Things are never as great as they seem and things are never as bad as they seem. And I rarely speak in absolute terms, never, always, everybody. But in this particular case, it absolutely applies. Um, when you're at your lowest low, it's it, you'll, you'll make likely rash decisions, right? Um, I've also learned that right at that point when you think you can't, you, you're, you can't go on when you're right at that ceiling immediately beyond that is the breakthrough immediately beyond that is the yeah. breakthrough yeah. and I've noticed it with myself mostly with injuries not just losing my leg um, but ticky tack injuries you know as an athlete a sprained ankle right a ruptured labrum like that can just devastate an athlete and going through you know having to get operated on surgery recovery you know, you're recovering, recovering, you're doing all the right things. And it's like, I'm right at that breaking point where I, I think I'm out of the game. Like, I think my lifestyle is going to have to drastically change because my shoulder is never going to be the same as it was. My wrist, my foot, you know, whatever it is. And then, you know, the next day or two days later, there's like a breakthrough, right? Mm-hmm. My range of motion now just opened up. I'm able to actually pick up that gallon of milk that I couldn't do for months. Like I was right there. I was right at that point where I felt like I am not, I'm never going to be able to do this thing. And then you just stay on it a little longer and it's right there. You know what I mean? So just keeping things in perspective, I think is critical um, because it can, it can feel pretty heavy, man. And it can weigh you down. Um, Something I, I, I hope to be able to project is, you know, really anything is possible, which is a cliche, you know, kind of phrase, but you know, we're really only limited by the limits we place on ourselves. And it all exists in your mind, man. It's yeah. all just in your mind. And, uh, you know, something I, 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 I try to work past and find ways to make it, these, these things more applicable 
um, to someone who's not in the military, someone who doesn't spend time in the gym or in jiu-jitsu. Like, you know, you look at athletes and soldiers, and it's very easy to kind of chalk them up as someone who's kind of cut from a different cloth, right? Like, I'm not like that person. Like, that person can do that stuff, but I'm not, I'm not him, right? I'm not a Green Beret. I'm not a jiu-jitsu fighter. I'm not, like, whatever it is. Right. Um, really, what you're, do- <clears throat> what you're doing, the power of language is you're really just making these excuses for yourself. You're justifying why those principles don't apply to me. Like, oh yeah, this methodology is great. It worked for him, but he's a six foot six SF guy. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm whoever that person is. You know, it's just, a, it's an easy out. But the reality is, is that stuff absolutely does apply to you. I'm not cut from a different cloth. I don't come from a different planet. I'm a human being just like anybody else who was just put into a set of circumstances that is unusual. And then I was able to get past it and do more unusual things. But those were just products of the environment that I was in and the circumstances that I was, the hand that I was dealt at that time. Right. A challenge is a challenge. Adversity is an adversity. And when all this stuff exists within invisible space in your brain and in your mind and in your heart and your soul, you have the ownership of that. We all really do. Um, so just remembering that, not making those rash decisions when things seem hopeless, um, knowing and being convinced that with, with an adjustment of your mentality and your focus and what you're willing to sacrifice and the amount of work you're able to put into it, the only limitations are the ones that, that we choose to put there, really. So what's, what's next for you? Yeah, what is next for me? That's a good question, man. Um, my team and I, we just got back from our most recent deployment. Um, so we're just kind of getting back into our, our training cycle right now. Mm-hmm. So I have my eyes set on some personal development stuff um, at work. Um, and then we're going through kind of a restructure of, of my team right now. We got really a senior team. So it's about that time for a lot of them to move on um, to kind of the next phase of their career trajectory, working as instructors or in some other more unique positions uh, before eventually kind of coming back to a team. It's kind of the life cycle. So as a warrant officer on a team, you know, I focus on kind of long range planning and strategy and mentorship. Uh, so I'm really excited for you know, to get this new crop of new guys that are coming onto the team. We just got a, a couple new dudes that just, just showed up. So being able to, to help mold them a little bit is something I'm looking forward to. Um, my wife and I just had our most recent boy. He's 10, 12 weeks or so. So really just taking advantage of the time I have with them is great. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I got six more years left of active duty time until I hit 20. And I have every intention of fulfilling that contractual obligation. Um, I could medically retire tomorrow, but um, I, I love what I do. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy the amount of time I have left in uniform as much as I can. Uh, that said, you know, I am kind of looking at that, what that next evolution may look like. Because I know to, to really build anything and to be great at it, there is a metric that could be broken down by the hour, according to some people of investment that you need to place in that. And, you know, 10 years time is kind of a number that comes up a lot. Right. Right. Like Malcolm Gladwell is 10,000 hours. Like if you're going to hit that to really break past the threshold of normal or average into the realm of greatness requires 10,000 hours. And this has got some pretty convincing case studies of people that are wildly successful that when you crunch the numbers, they all landed right around there, right? So you do the math on that, how much time you're able to invest while you're working 40, 60 hours a week, yeah. you know, it could easily take you a decade. So um, I have every intention of whatever I move into next to be striving to be the very best I can at it. So I'm recognizing now that I really do need to start investing some time into that. And, you know, I, I think it'll be sim- similar to what I do now. Right? I've lived a life of, of service for quite some time, and I continue to, I, I plan to continue to do so moving forward. It'll just, you know, be, I won't be in uniform. You know, it'll be in different capacity. Um, so, you know, planning that out, seeing what that looks like. Um, and, you know, just on the periphery, man, like what I do for a living requires a lot, a lot of focus and attention. So um, I'm eager to 
again, kind of readjust my approach, readjust the design. You know, where can I make those sacrifices now to be able to invest in what my future is going to look like in six, seven years? Yeah. That process is really happening right now. And, um, you know, it's exciting and scary at the same time. Yeah, it's a new challenge. It's a new challenge. Yeah. You know, uh, my wife and I, we've got two boys. One's four, one's 12 weeks. So, you know, you introduce that in the equation and, you know, it certainly makes Hands things more difficult. Yeah, yeah. man, you know, but it's it's all it's awesome and it's all doable. You know what yeah. I mean? It's all doable. My wife's a go-getter. Uh, she's active duty military as well. So she's moving at a thousand miles an hour. It's really just, you know, syncing things up. What, wh- Where can I trim some fat? Um keeping my priorities in line, you know, family being number one, and then my profession, my training, my education, uh, my future, all kind of falling in line with that as well. So that's happening in real time right now, man. So yeah. it's uh, it's exciting, as scary as it can be, as daunting as it can be. Um, but this is what, you know, this all is about. what we're here for, man. Absolutely. We're here, this is what we're here for. What's that next ridge line? You know, and then get ready to climb it. Getting after it. Well, yeah, you know, I, I, before we wrap up, I want to commend you and thank you for your sacrifices that you've made and being the standard, uh, definitely that I aspire to like reach for, uh, when I'm working, like whether it's hard work, my mentality, you know, serving. Um, I think that through the past weekend and just this conversation, you embody it, uh, through and through. And, um, before we, before we finish up, you know, where can people find you? Where, where can they learn more about you? Yeah, so the, um, we actually have a website up now, which is uh, machinenick.com, and that has links to pretty much all my stuff, my social media platforms, YouTube. Um, it's got all the nonprofits that I work with, which is something I'm real proud about. Um, and then uh, points of contact, better reach out to me directly. You know, my accessibility is something I take a lot of pride in, and I really prioritize that. So uh, it, the, the influx continues to grow, which is great. Yeah. Um, but I work backwards through time. So it may, it may take a month before I can get to it because I'm traveling for work or whatever it is, but I, I work myself backwards. Um, and that's something I, again, I, I take a lot of pride in and I, I take it very seriously. So I, I, it, I, I say with, with no lightness and, and true sincerity, um, by all means, reach out. You know, if there's a question, whether it's military related or training related or amputee related, um, I want to be an SF guy. Like, what do I do? Uh, by all means, hit me up, and uh, you know I will I will respond. Awesome, man! Thanks for the time. Yeah, man, great to talk to you, brother. Appreciate it.